Chapter Three, Part Two of English Men of Science by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Origin and Taste for Science, Part Two. Analysis of replies. Having given the replies in gross, now it becomes our business to sort their contents under different heads. It would be useless and even embarrassing to make lengthy extracts from them. Short abstracts will therefore be given, which the reader may verify whenever he pleases by the help of the reference number printed in parenthesis, which is in the same both here and in the original. A. Innate Tastes Instances of a strong taste for scientific being decidedly innate. I have not included among these the whole of the cases to which an A has been affixed. Physics and Mathematics, 12 cases out of 20 replies. 1. My tastes are entirely innate. They date from childhood. 2. As far back as I can remember. I love nature and desire to learn her secrets. 3. Always attracted by men of ability. 4. From an early age, I was addicted to mechanical pursuits, then to chemistry. 5. Naturally fond of mechanics and physical science. 6. My tastes were partially natural, partially encouraged. 7. I remember incidents which proved an innate taste before I could write. 8. I had an innate wish for miscellaneous information. 11. Primarily derived, both by inheritance and education, from my father. 16. I always regarded mathematics as the method of obtaining both the most useful and the most harmonious, etc. 17. My taste for mathematics appears innate. As a boy, I delighted in sums. 18. An early taste for arithmetic, and in particular for long division sums. Chemistry, five cases out of eleven. One, thoroughly innate. Two, perhaps wholly innate. Three, I was always observing and inquiring. Four, they date from a very early period, and there was little to produce them in my early surroundings. Five, from an early age I had an innate taste for all branches of science. Geology, at least seven out of eight cases. One, decidedly innate. Two, a natural taste for observing and generalizing developed. Three, a natural taste. My interest in science began very early. 4. I believe I may say innate, but to a very considerable extent. 5. I was always fond of natural history. 6. As well as I can recollect, they were innate. 7. I believe the desire for information and habits of observation to be in great measure innate. Zoology. 18 cases out of 24. 1. Yes, inherited from my father's family. 2. Certainly innate. 3. Love of observation and natural history innate. 4. Homology innate. 5. I believe I inherited my general taste for scientific pursuits. 6. Thoroughly innate. Bones and shells were attractive to me before I could consider them with any apparent profit. 7. Innate love of nature and observation of natural phenomena. 8. I should say innate. I caught at all scraps of lessons for self-improvement. 9. I cannot recollect the time when I was not fond of animals and of knowing all I could learn about them. 11. Love of birds and their study. I feel that I must have had a taste for science independently of external circumstances. 12. My taste for science was entirely innate. 13. As a boy, I had a passion for mechanical contrivances. My scientific tastes are altogether innate. 14. I was always fond of construction. My turn for scientific inquiry led me in early life to systematize the knowledge of others. 15. Largely inherited from my father. 17. They appear to have been inherited. 18. Nearly in an equal degree the mixed result of a natural bias in education. 19. I should have been an observer of animal life under whatever conditions I might have lived. 20. I believe my interest in zoology to have been innate. Botany. Eight cases out of ten. One, my scientific tastes were inborn. Two, as far as the word applies in any case, I should say decidedly innate. Three, always fond of plants. Four, was always fond of objective and experimental knowledge. Five, as a youth I followed of my own free will chemistry and other sciences. Six, a taste for natural science, especially botany, seems to have been innate. Seven, scientific tastes apparently innate. Eight, a natural inclination. Medical science. Only two cases out of seven. 1. Innate in a great degree. 2. 
i conclude the tastes were innate as they showed themselves the moment the opportunity for developing them occurred statistics three cases out of six one certainly my scientific tastes appear to me to have been so to say innate three innate i think four much inclined to think there was an innate tendency mechanical science at least two cases out of five one if any tastes be innate mine were they date from beyond my recollection two decidedly innate instances of tastes being decidedly not innate physics and mathematics one case out of twenty fifteen i am not aware of any innate taste for science chemistry one case out of eleven ten i did nothing serious until estimate twenty three my pursuit of chemistry is entirely due to circumstances occurring after manhood zoology three cases out of twenty four sixteen i doubt much their innate character twenty two i do not consider them innate but induced twenty four not at all innate botany one case out of ten ten not innate medical four cases out of seven three not at all especially innate four i cannot perceive that they were innate six i cannot say that i had naturally a turn for any pursuit in particular seven accidentally directed to medicine statistics one at most out of six two my interest in science was due to my having been officially employed in a statistical inquiry it is with much hesitation that i consent to enter this as a case of not innate a table is displayed on the page summary of results as to innate tastes there are four columns with total cases decidedly innate decidedly not innate and doubtful the total down the bottom on the far left reads as physics and mathematics chemistry and mineralogy geology biology with subsections of zoology botany medical science geography not discussed separately statistical science and mechanical science physics and mathematics total cases 20 decidedly innate 12 decidedly not innate 1 doubtful 7 chemistry and mineralogy total cases 11 decidedly innate 5 decidedly not innate 1 doubtful 5 geology total cases 8 decidedly innate 7 decidedly not innate 0 doubtful 1 biology zoology total cases 24 decidedly innate 17 decidedly not innate 3 doubtful 4 botany total cases 10 decidedly innate 8 decidedly not innate 1 doubtful 1 medical science total cases 7 decidedly innate 2 decidedly not innate 4 doubtful 1 geography not discussed separately total cases 0 decidedly innate 0 decidedly not innate 0 doubtful 0 statistical science total cases 6 decidedly innate 3 decidedly not innate 1 doubtful 2 mechanical science total cases 5 decidedly innate 2 decidedly not innate 0 doubtful 3 total cases total 91 decidedly innate total 56 decidedly not innate total 11 doubtful total 24 a mere glance at the table and at the foregoing extracts will probably be enough to convince the reader that a strong and innate taste for science is a prevailing characteristic among scientific men also that the taste is enduring this latter peculiarity is by no means a necessary consequence of the former on the contrary the ruling motives in the dispositions of a man usually change as he grows older the love of inquiring in childhood being superseded by the fierce passions of youth and these by the ambitions of more mature life but a special taste for science seems frequently to be so ingrained in the constitution of scientific men that it asserts itself throughout their whole existence obviously it must have had great influence in directing their early studies and in ensuring their successful prosecution of them in after years it would be a curious inquiry to seek the limits of a special taste that is the diversity of the objects any one of which would satisfy it i think the indications are clear that the tastes of some of my correspondents are far more special than those of others and that the latter have checked a tendency to desultoriness 
by their strength of will or have had it checked by the necessities of their position as professors or professional men or at most of all by the possession of that strange quality which the phrenologists call adhesivists but which seem to defy analysis it exists in very different strength in different persons and i know not where to find a better illustration of its power than in the ordinary case of a man falling in love for the first time few lookers-on will doubt that almost any young man is capable of falling in love with any one of at least one-third of the presentable young women of his race and social position if they happen to see much of one another under favourable circumstances and without other distraction yet although the innate taste is of so general a character it becomes specialised at once by the mere act of falling in love then the image of one woman takes complete possession of his thoughts she is for a considerable period the only female who has attractions for him although he may previously have had equally attracted by any one of tens of thousands of her sex a strong taste bearing remotely on science may prove very helpful the love of collecting which is a trifling tendency in itself common to children idiots and magpies often leads to the study of the things collected and is of immense use to a man who wishes to study objects that must be collected in large numbers i have been told of an astronomer whose primary taste was a love of polished brass instruments and smooth mechanical movements but that nothing satisfied this taste so fully as work with telescopes and from loving the instruments he soon learnt to love the work for which they were used a taste for careful drawing works well into engineering and into systematic botany or zoology a love of adventure and field sports may be an extremely useful element in the character of a man who follows geology or zoology as a rough numerical estimate it seems that six out of every ten men of science were gifted by nature with a strong taste for it certainly not one person in ten taken at haphazard possesses such an instinct therefore i contend that its presence adds fivefold at least to the chance of scientific success the converse way of looking at the question gives a similarly large estimate certainly one half of the population have no care for science and an extremely small population of that half succeed in it nay further it appears though i cannot publish facts in evidence without violating my rule of avoiding personal allusions that of the men who have no natural taste for science and yet succeed in it may belong to gifted families and may therefore be accredited with sufficient general abilities to leave their mark on whatever subject it becomes their business to undertake we may therefore rest assured that the possession of a strong special taste is a precious capital and that it is a wicked waste of natural power to thwart it ruthlessly by a false system of education but i can give no test which shall distinguish in boyhood between a taste that is destined to endure and a passing fancy further than by remarking that whenever the aptitudes seem hereditary they deserve peculiar consideration instinctive tastes for science are generally speaking not so strongly hereditary as the more elementary qualities of the body and mind i have tabulated the replies and find the proportion to be one case of inheritance to four that are not inherited from either parent there is no case in which the correspondent speaks of having inherited a love of science from his mother though of course she may and probably has often transmitted it from a grandparent i have a curious case among the returns sent to me of a passion for heraldry characterizing a great nephew and a great uncle the latter of whom have died before the former was born i have another of an eminent statistician in whom a love of figures and tabulation was highly characteristic of his grandparent and is very strongly marked in himself but was wholly absent in his parent and all other known members of his small family there have been numerous and most curious cases of a love of figures and tabulation in my own family which richly deserve a full description it was carried to so strange an extravagance by one of its members a lady now deceased that i can do no sufficient justice to her peculiarities by speaking in general terms i ought to give pages of anecdote b fortunate accidents we next come to a group of cases which imply a latent taste for science namely where a lifelong pursuit of it was first determined by some small accident the previous indifference or equilibrium of the mind was unstable a push was accidentally given its position was wholly changed and it rested in one of stable equilibrium these cases are not numerous only ten altogether but i put them in the second place on account of their affinity to those in the first physics and mathematics nineteen refer to this chemistry one possession of a chemical box when i was a little boy 
three from lectures i attended when a boy nine to reading by accident a book on chemistry geology two fossiliferous rocks near the school where i was zoology nine a travelling fellowship sixteen accidentally reading a book brought me back to scientific studies previously suspended owing to my profession twenty two gift when a boy of a box of british shells with a book to explain them botany ten accidental receipt of de candles flore francaise when residing in france medical science none statistics four very clear occasional lectures when a boy mechanics two a particular study at a university which accidentally became of professional importance c indirect motives or opportunities this group has also considerable affinity to group a and has been alluded to in the remarks appended to the extracts referring to it it includes those cases in which the mind was partially but not largely deflected from its natural bent that portion of the innate tendency which admitted of being resolved in the direction of the scientific pursuit being satisfied the remainder being wasted these cases are not numerous only sixteen altogether but i give them the third place for the same reason that i give group b the second physics and mathematics five possession of special instruments eight choosing engineering as a profession but not following it nineteen love of yachting leading to researches on magnetism of ships chemistry six the obtaining of correct and accurate results in chemical analysis gave me great satisfaction geology one interest in discoveries made in blank three a very early love of experimental chemistry six should have followed chemistry and physics but circumstances blank gave opportunities for geology zoology five my choosing blank for special investigation was due to a positive fascination from the obscurity of the subject nine my father's and brother's pursuit of field sports and thence indirectly to natural history thirteen an early passion for mechanism which led me to take to physiology and anatomy as the engineering side of my profession fifteen my taste for biology began with keeping insects twenty four blank subsequently to the desire to investigate certain questions bearing on medicine botany none medical science three connection of hospital and medical school with the place of his residence four love of facts and the impression that good surgery is a great fact statistics none mechanics three profession fell in with natural tastes such as sketching four innate faculties serviceable to profession under the pressure of circumstances d professional duties the fourth group compromises instances in which professional duty was a principal cause of the interest first felt in scientific pursuits or else of the energies being concentrated upon some branch of science towards special inclination had previously been exhibited two or three of the twenty-one cases which i shall quote may perhaps be thought doubtful examples and more appropriate to the preceding group but after all possible deductions have been made there will remain ample evidence of the magnitude of the influence we are considering a wise administrator desirous even at some cost of promoting original investigation would establish many professional offices of a scientific character having responsible duties of a prominent kind attached to them they would create much new interest in science and would compel those who held them to work steadily and to a purpose in scientific harness physics and mathematics for had never attended specially to physics till appointed professor of natural philosophy this induced me to give up chemistry and to devote myself definitively to physics nine solitary observing for years as director of an observatory thirteen professional duties in civil engineering blank official exploration of blank fourteen largely determined by service in north polar and equatorial expeditions fifteen my interest in astronomy was very small indeed until i was appointed to the directorship of an observatory chemistry eight the university invited me to fill the chair of blank gave my work its bent geology none zoology one largely determined by being appointed blank ten partially by my selection of medicine as a profession thirteen my appointment to a surveying ship made me a comparative anatomist blank that too blank forced me to paleontology seventeen first began to concentrate energies to one branch when appointed blank eighteen 
my scientific tastes were determined by professional study twenty three to the profession of medicine in physiology anatomy and blank twenty four subsequently to my desire to investigate certain subjects bearing on my profession of medicine botany seven never took up botany to any extent till the professorship was vacant there is some conflict of testimony here medical science one partly to my profession two i selected the medical profession because it was that of my father this choice led me to scientific pursuits three i did not follow my own branch from any special liking indeed i rather disliked it but it was necessary to earn a livelihood and to follow some branch six my addiction to medicine was purely the result of accident i never gave a thought to physics as a subject of study until i was twenty-seven years old seven accidental to medicine statistics two due to official employment when young in a very important statistical inquiry mechanics too the science of blank which i learnt accidentally became serviceable to me when employed as an engineer three my profession fell in with my natural tastes four pressure of circumstances e encouragement at home nearly one-third of the scientific men have expressed themselves indebted to encouragement at home they received it in various ways sometimes the influence of the parent was strong and direct their origin was due beyond all doubt to my father's influence sometimes it was strong but general as i was in a general atmosphere of scientific thinking and discussion sometimes it went no further than indulgence as permission to carry on little experiments at home in a room set apart for the purpose under each and all of these shapes it was truly welcome and its effectiveness may be in some measure estimated by the vastly smaller number of cases in which success was obtained in direct opposition to family influences scientific studies in boyhood are apt to meet with scant favour at home they deal too much in abstractions on the one hand and sensible messes and mischief to furniture and clothes on the other they lead to no clearly lucrative purpose and occupy time which might be apparently better bestowed these hindrances were far more seriously felt when the men on my list were young when apparatus was hardly to be procured and when scientific work was exceptional i ascribe many of the cases of encouragement to the existence of an hereditary link that is to say the son had inherited scientific tastes and was encouraged by the parent from whom he had inherited them and who naturally sympathized with him attention should be given to the relatively small encouragement received from the mother i have sorted the extracts so as to permit the comparison to be easily made the female mind has special excellencies of a high order and the value of its influence in various ways is one that i can never consent to underrate but that influence is towards enthusiasm and love as distinguished from philanthropy not towards calm judgment nor inclusively towards science in many respects the character of scientific men is strongly anti-feminine their mind is directed to facts and abstract theories and not to persons or human interests the man of science is deficient in the purely emotional element and in the desire to influence the beliefs of others thus i find that two out of every ten do not care for politics at all they are devoid of partisanship they school a naturally equable and independent mind to a still more complete subordination to their judgment in many respects they have little sympathy with female ways of thought it is a curious proof of this that in the very numerous answers which have reference to parental influence that of the father is quoted three times as often as that of the mother it would not have been the case judging from inquiries i elsewhere made if i had been discussing the antecedents of literary men commanders or statesmen or still more of divines physics and mathematics ten the origin of my interest in blank is mainly due to my father's knowledge of geology navigation and engineering eleven primarily derived both by education and inheritance from my father chemistry three permission to carry on little experiments at home in a room set apart for the purpose blank subsequently residing abroad and my mother making a home for me there four i was taught at home with my brothers we had always the example of industry and were encouraged to think for ourselves eight my father gave me some books on chemistry and i owe to my mother a child's curiosity and afterward a man's reverence for scientific truth eleven my taste received no encouragement whatever from relations my mother accepted geology one my father and aunt collected specimens four 
I was indebted to a high degree to collections made by my father and mother. 7. I was encouraged by the example of an elder brother. Zoology 9. The example of my father and elder brothers, who were all pretty firm to field sports, was also followed by me, and from field sports to field natural history is but a step. 15. I inherited from my father. I was in a general atmosphere of scientific thinking and discussion. 21. I may have derived, inherited, the tendency from my mother. I belonged to an industrious family and saw everyone working. 1. Traditionally derived and inherited from my father's family, i.e. from father, grandfather, etc. 6. My father had no scientific knowledge, nevertheless he encouraged me. 7. I trace it to the love of truth and of mental cultivation in my father and to his encouragement of this love in his children. 11. That I inherited a strong love of nature from my father is certain, who was devoted to horticulture and very fond of birds. 16. Their origin was due, beyond all doubt, to my father's influence. 17. My interest in science arose from the example of my father and blank, etc. 19. I trace it to the earliest impressions of my childhood, all of which are connected with my father and the animals he brought me as pets. 23. To my father's example in science. 4. Decidedly to my mother's observations in our childhood rambles. 8. My soon developed enthusiasm must have been derived from my mother's family. Botany. 2. A little encouragement at home. 6. The love of botany was instilled into me in very early youth by my father. 8. To my father's encouragement of a natural inclination. 10. And to encouragement from my mother. Medical science. 1. Partially to my mother's mental activity and love of collecting and arranging, and to my father's constant encouragement of my pursuit. Statistics. 5. Partially acquired from intercourse with my father and blank. Mechanics. 5. I was always brought up in a half-scientific, half-literary atmosphere. 3. Family tradition derived through my mother's side. Two cases are mentioned in which the origin of the scientific tastes was partially due to the active assistance of the wife. One of these is botany, and the other I have ventured to suppress, as it did not appear to me sufficiently decided. F. The Influence and Encouragement of Friends this group has much in common with that of the indirect influences already classed under group c it includes cases where a fortuitous acquaintance has been the means of deciding probably by revealing a later taste or showing how some obstacle in the way of indulging it could easily be removed there is a wide interval often very difficult to get over between the study of a subject out of books and the practical investigation of it for oneself at this point of a man's mental progress, the help of a friend may be of immense assistance. He may give elementary hints which will remove formidable difficulties to a beginner who is utterly unused to experiment. It is told, I think, of a scholar that he laboured for successive days to make, with his own hands in his own chambers, a plum pudding according to a time-honoured family recipe, but he produced nothing except thick pastes or stirabouts of different degrees of lumpiness, revolting to the sight. At length he confided his difficulties to a lady, who explained that in making plum puddings it was a matter of course, and therefore not spoken of in the recipe, to put the ingredients into a bag before beginning to boil them. The example of a friend encourages a young man to overcome his diffidence and to firmly occupy any position that he knows by his own judgment to be true. Perhaps the greatest help of all is the consciousness of strength, which is given by cooperation on not very unequal terms with a veteran in performance and reputation. Out of the 91 cases, 18 speak gratefully of the influence and encouragement of friends. Physics and Mathematics 3. I was both his young friend and assistant for three years. He imbued me with his respect for science. Blank. Earnestness and accuracy. 6. Partially encouraged by an eminent friend. 13. Picked up an unsystematic education in science in the company of blank. 16. I was taken to see blank which was the origin of my experimentalizing. 17. I trace it to my acquaintance with blank and to going abroad with him. 19. The intimacy of his father with blank gave me a bias towards magnetism. Chemistry. 2. 
My taste for zoology arose through friendship with blank. Geology, too. The surgeon to whom I was articled fostered my tastes. For, to mining offices in Germany, to conversations with blank and blank, and acquaintance of blank. Five, through the acquaintance of blank, to the particular branch of geology that I have pursued. Zoology, three. The help of blank has aided me immensely. Ten. I was much under the influence of a remarkable man, a most accomplished naturalist. 23. The example of many men whom I knew when I was young proved a great stimulus and incentive. I can trace it distinctly to my intercourse with certain professors. Botany. 5. Blank was subsequently encouraged by eminent botanists. 9. I was thrown into the society of a gentleman who took much interest in botany. 10. There were determined afterwards by blank, and the friendship and encouragement of the four greatest British botanists of the day. Medical Science 1. Partially to the friendship of three eminent botanists. 7. Accidentally directed to medicine by associating with a medical friend in a superficial study of botany. Statistics 5. Partially from intercourse with my father and certain of his friends. Mechanical Science 2. The friendship of blank materially influenced my career. G. Influence and Encouragement of Tutors This group of 13 cases refers to the influence and encouragement of masters, tutors and professors. It is a small one, not because persons in those positions are incapable of exerting much salutary influence, but because the scientific men on my list seldom had the advantage of receiving congenial instruction. This is clearly proved by a comparison of the replies referring to Scotch and to English tuition. In Scotland, the university programme and the general method of teaching is much more suited to men of scientific bent of mind than those in England. Consequently, the influence of tutors has been testified to far more abundantly by those men on my list who have been educated in Scotland than by the rest. The proportions are striking and instructive. I find that about one-sixth of those from whom I have received returns have studied in Scotland. Hence, if professional influences had been equally efficacious on both sides of the tweed, there would have been five times as many expressions of gratitude to English teachers as to Scotch. But the facts show that no less than eight out of the thirteen cases refer to teachers in Scotland, one to a Scotch teacher settled in England, and only four to English professors. It would have been 8 multiplied by 5 equals 40 and not 4 if the English education had been as profitable to science as the Scotch. I willingly admit that the smallness of the numbers, namely only 13 cases, renders precise figures open to question. However, the superiority of the Scotch system is supported by other evidence which I shall speak of in the chapter on education. Physics and Mathematics 7 I believe the origin was when I attended the natural philosophy classes at blank. 10. Taste confirmed by lectures and especially by the encouragement of certain professors. 20. Interest in mathematics due to the encouragement of blank and influence of professors at a university. Chemistry. 7. Chiefly to being sent as a pupil to an eminent man of science. Geology. 5. Lectures by blank. Zoology, 5. My scientific tastes were largely promoted by the attractive teaching of blank various professors. 17. And to being the assistant and close companion of blank, 24, I can trace it in part distinctly to my intercourse with certain professors. Botany, 4. I date my first efforts of any consequence from an early intimacy with blank, whose pupil and assistant I was. The necessity of accurate work would then dawned upon me. 6. The companionship of blank incited me to prosecute botany with vigour. I was one of his best pupils and travelled with him. Medical Science 4. Subsequently, by the approval of teachers, having been selected chief assistant. Statistics 4. Very clear occasional lectures. When a boy on moral and economical subjects, the tastes were afterwards developed by a good education. 6. Professor Blank's lectures were the origin of my interest in geology. It was the earliest scientific pursuit of this correspondent. Mechanical Science. None. H. Travel in Distant Parts. 
there are only eight cases in this group namely those in which the aspects of nature under new conditions have developed a love for science few men of scientific training have had opportunities of distant travel but on those few their actions have been very strong especially as regards biologists and physicists i say nothing here in respect to mere geographers and quote none of their replies because its importance to them requires neither proof nor comment men are too apt to accept as an axiomatic law not capable of further explanation whatever they see recurring day after day without fail so the dog in the back yard looks on the daily arrival of the postman butcher and baker as so many elementary phenomena not to be barked at or wandered about travel in distant countries by unsettling those quasi axiomatic ideas restores to the educated man the freshness of childhood in observing new things and in seeking reasons for all he sees i believe that a handsome endowment of travelling fellowships thoroughly well paid with extra allowance for any special work allotted to their holders given only to young men of high qualifications and lasting for at least five years would be money well bestowed in the furtherance of science physics and mathematics three to some extent my tastes were determined by events after manhood because for ten years i held positions of great responsibility in distant parts of the world but i considered they were formed in my youth nine ocean voyaging in the beginning of life solitary observing for years in a country verging on a desert under southern skies thirteen the distinct origin blank was the wonderful effect on me by the aspects of nature as seen in the blank combined with what i may call the accident of having been allowed to explore part of it in an official capacity fourteen largely determined by my service in north polar and equatorial expeditions chemistry none geology seven subsequently much influenced by being thrown at estimate nineteen on my own judgment and resources in founding a mining colony in the backwoods of blank and carrying it out quite alone zoology two strongly confirmed and erected by the voyage in the blank thirteen my appointment to the surveying ship blank made me a comparative anatomist by affording opportunities for the investigation of the structure of the lower animals botany five they were directed to botany purely through accidental circumstances which led to a prolonged residence in an imperfectly civilized country z unclass residuum we now come to the final group namely those influences which cannot be sorted into any of the eight groups with definite titles which we have already examined at the outset i spoke of these unclassed conditions as forming a class by themselves of no great importance and which might be indefinitely reduced in proportion as we chose to pursue our analysis i estimate that the ninety one replies which i have received and analyzed assigned a total of one hundred ninety one causes it now appears that no less than one hundred and eighty eight of these fall into one or other of eight definite groups and that there remain only three on our hands for the unclassed residuum even these are apparently due to aggregates of conditions the more important of which would probably find their place among the eight groups leaving a still minuter residue we may lightly dismiss them as of inappreciably small importance in our present inquiry chemistry ten entirely due to circumstances after manhood and in direct opposition to family influences eleven to opportunity at a foreign university geology eight the taste developed gradually after manhood summary if we take a general survey of our national stock of capabilities and their produce we see that the large part is directed to gain daily bread and necessary luxuries and to keep the great social machine in steady work the surplus is considerable and may be disposed of in various ways let us now put ourselves in the position of advocates of science solely and consider from that point of view how out of the surplus capabilities of the nation might be diverted to its furtherance how can the tastes of men be most powerfully acted upon to affect them towards science the large category a of innate tastes is practically beyond our immediate influence but though we cannot increase the national store we need not waste it as we do now every instance in which a man having an aptitude to succeed in science is tempted by circumstances which might be controlled to occupy himself with subjects of less national value is a public calamity aptitudes and tastes for occupations which enrich the thoughts and productive powers of man are as much articles of national wealth as coal and iron and their waste is as reprehensible 
Educational monopolies, which offer numerous and great prizes for work of other descriptions, have caused enormous waste of scientific ability by inducing those who might have succeeded in science to spend their energies with small effect on uncongenial occupations. When a pursuit is instinctive and the will is untaxed, an immense amount of work may be accomplished with ease, witness to take an extreme case the sustained action of the wholly involuntary muscles. The heart does its work unceasingly from birth to death, and it is no light work. But such as the arm working a pump handle would soon weary of maintaining or again think of the migratory flight of birds. In obedience to an instinct or of the muscular force astonishing both in magnitude and endurance exhibited by lunatics who have some real though morbid passion which goes them to exercise it. We must therefore learn to respect innate tastes which directly as in A or indirectly as in C serve the cause of science. As regards B, the fortunate accidents weaken multiply opportunities. There is great hope in respect to D, the professional influences. It is clear to all who have knowledge of the scope of modern science that there exists an immense deal of national work which has to be performed, and which none but men of scientific cultures are qualified to undertake. Scientific superintendence is required for all kinds of technical education, for statistical investigations of innumerable kinds and deductions from them, for sanitary administration in the broadest sense, for agriculture, mining, industrial occupations, or engineering. There is everywhere a demand for scientific assessors who shall discover how to economise effort and find out new processes and fruitful principles. Professional duties generally ought to be more closely bound up with strictly scientific work than they are at present, and this requirement would tend to foster scientific tastes in minds which had little inborn tendency that way. In respect to G, the influence and encouragement of tutors, seeing how far Scotland had surpassed England in the attractiveness of her mode of teaching, which is by professional lectures rather than by classwork, it is clear that the English system admits of being greatly improved and the influence of her teachers proportionally increased in turning the minds of youth to science. Lastly, as regards H, travel in distant lands, its indirect value deserves far more than the moderate sums assigned to its prosecution in the way of staff travelling fellowships and rare voyages of surveying ships. To sum up in a few words, it seems to me that the interpretation to be put on the replies we have now been considering is that a love of science might be largely extended by fostering and not thwarting innate tendencies by the extension of scientific professional appointments and professorships, by assimilating in some cases the English system of teaching to that of the Scotch and by creating travelling and other fellowships which shall enable their holders to view nature in various aspects and to work with foreigners whose habits of thought are fruitful in themselves but of a different kind to our own i will take this opportunity of drawing attention to what appears to me one of the greatest desiderata of this kind in the present day namely the establishment of medical fellowships amply sufficient to enable the best youths who intend to follow medicine as a profession to spend their early manhood in prosecuting independent medical researches i appeal to capitalists who know not what use free from abuse to make of their surplus wealth to consider this want they might greatly improve the practical skill of the english medical profession by affording opportunities of prolonged study they might perhaps themselves reap some part of the benefit of it a young medical man has now to waste the most vigorous years of his life in miserable routine work simply to obtain bread until he has been able to establish his reputation he has no breathing time allowed him the cares of mature life press too closely upon his student days to give him the opportunities of prolonged study that are necessary to accomplish him for his future profession the influences we have been considering are those which urge men to pursue science rather than literature politics or other careers but we must not forget that there are deep and obscure movements of national life which may quicken or depress the effective ability of the nation as a whole I have not considered the reasons why one period is more productive of great men than another, my inquiry being limited for the reasons stated in the first pages of this book to one period and nation, but it may be remarked that the national condition most favourable to general efficiency is one of self-confidence and eager belief in the existence of great works capable of accomplishment. The opposite attitude is indifferentism, founded on sheer uncertainty of what is best to do or on despair of being strong enough to achieve useful results a feeling such as that which has generally existed in recent years among wealthy men in respect to pauperism and charitable gifts a common effect of indifferentism is to dissipate the energy of the nation upon trifles 
and this tendency seems to be a crying evil of the present day in our own country in illustration of this view i will quote the following extract from a letter of one of my correspondents who i should add is singularly well qualified to form a just opinion on the matter to which he is so forcibly calls attention the principal hindrance to inquiry and all other intellectual progress in the people of whom i see much is the elaborate machinery for wasting time which has been invented and recommended under the name of social duties considering the mental and material capital of which the richer classes have the disposal i believe that much more than half the progressive force of the nation runs to waste from this cause a great deal of energy is wasted in attempting to seize more than can be grasped there is a feverish tendency fostered by the daily press to interest oneself in all that goes on which leads to perpetual destruction and curtails the time available for serious and sustained effort it may be worth while to mention a curious little morbid experience of my own as suggestive of much more mischief it is this a few years ago i had foolishly overworked myself as many others have done misled by a perverted instinct which goaded to increased exertion instead of dictating rest the consequence was that i fairly broke down and could not for some days even look at a book or any sort of writing i went abroad and though i grew much better and could amuse myself with books the first town where i experienced real repose was rome there was no doubt of the influence of the place it was strongly marked and for a long time i sought in vain for the reason of it at last what i accepted as a full and adequate explanation occurred to me simply that there were no advertisements on the walls there was a picturesqueness and grandeur in the streets which sufficed to fill the mind and there were no petty distractions to fret a weak and and brain when we are in health we take little count of the racket of english life which may keep a pathetic minds from stagnation but which causes needless wear and tear to active ones suggesting nothing useful and teasing distracting and wearying i have heard german professors speak with wonder at our waste of energy in mere fidget and in so-called amusements which are mostly very dull and ascribe the successful laboriousness of their own countrymen to the greater simplicity of the lives they lead and they are a happier people than we are partial failures we have seen that energy health steady pursuit of purpose business habits independence of views and a strong innate taste for science are generally combined in the character of a successful scientific man probably one half of the men on my list possess every one of these qualities in a considerable and some in a high degree if one or more of these qualities be deficient success becomes impossible lest its absence be appropriately supplemented by other qualities or conditions causes may be specified in which too few of the above-mentioned qualities were present and which consequently ended in an abortive career one is the possession of energy health and independence of character in excess and little else to control them these are dangerous gifts those who have them are apt to renounce guidances by which the great body of mankind move safely and to follow out a career in which they are almost certain to blunder and fail egregiously probably every large emigrant ship takes out many such men full of unjustifiable self-confidence who to use a current phrase knock about in the world waste their health use and opportunities and end broken down another case is that in which a strong innate taste for science is accompanied by independence of character and steadiness of pursuit but with no other quality helpful to success in which therefore leads to no useful result there is hardly a village where some ingenious man may not be found who has ideas and much shrewdness but is crotchety and impracticable he wants energy and business habits so he never rises many of these men brood over subjects like perpetual motion their peculiarities are well illustrated in de morgan's book of paradoxes again we frequently meet persons of a stamp that justifies the old-fashioned caricature of scientific men who are absorbed in some petty investigation utterly deficient in business habits and noted for absence of mind even idiots have often strongly quasi scientific tastes as love for simple mechanisms or objects in natural history and they have as already remarked a pleasure in collecting madmen have often persistency as is shown by their brooding on a single topic we all of us must have met with curious cases of failures where a mind and disposition that promises much for success never achieves it it may be that some mental screw is loose or there is some irreparable weakness of judgment or some untimely irresolution or rashness any fault of this kind is sufficient to mar a man's chances when competition is keen to obtain the highest order of success two things are wanted 
first the qualities of the man must either be good or round or else he must be so circumstanced as to be able when the need arises to supplement his deficiencies by extraneous help secondly he must have some very useful qualities highly developed it is said that genius is required for high success and there is much talk about what genius is and on the failures of men of genius while some persons go so far as to doubt the existence of genius as a separate quality it appears to me that what is generally meant by genius when the world is used in a special sense is the automatic activity of the mind as distinguished from the effort of the will in a man of genius the ideas come as by inspiration in other words his character is enthusiastic his mental associations are rapid numerous and firm his imagination is vivid and he is driven rather than drives himself all men have some genius they are all apt under excitement to show flashes of unusual enthusiasm and to experience swift and strange associations of ideas in dreams all men commonly exhibit more vivid powers of imagination than are possessed by the greatest artists when awake sober plodding will is quite another quality and its over-exercise exhausts the more sprightly functions of the mind as is expressed in the proverb too much work makes a dull boy but no man is likely to achieve very high success in whom the automatic power of the mind or genius in its special sense and a sober will are not well developed and fairly balanced end of chapter three part two of english men of science by francis galton Chapter 4 of English Men of Science by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4 Education. Preliminary education, praised throughout or nearly so. Merits in education, merits and demerits balanced. Demerits. Summary. Conclusion. I now pass on to the education which the scientific men had in their youth, in the hope that my results may give assistance to those who are endeavouring to frame systems of education suitable to the wants of the day. What I have to say is very partial. It refers solely to the opinions the scientific men entertain of the merits and faults of their own several educations in bygone days. Their views are remarkably unanimous, considering the very different branches of inquiry they are interested in and the great dissimilarities in their education. One third of those who sent replies have been educated at Oxford or Cambridge, one third at Scotch, Irish or London universities, and the remaining third at no university at all. I am totally unable to decide which of the three groups occupies a higher scientific position. They seem to me very much alike in this respect. The questions to which the following replies were given were as follows. Was your education especially conductive to or restrictive of habits of observation? Was your education eminently conductive to health or the reverse? What do you consider to have been peculiar merits in your education? What were the chief omissions in it, and what faults of commission can you indicate? I also asked for information concerning the places of education, both schools and colleges, and as regards home and self-instruction. The answers were, in some cases, very interesting from their minute elaboration, but I am of course restricted on this occasion to a simple treatment of them. I cannot now paint with delicate tints, but must content myself with broad lights and shades. The following answers are extracts, and in some few cases abstracts. They convey the general tone of the several replies as nearly as possible. The groups under which I have sorted them are these. Merits. Education praised throughout, or nearly so, 10 replies. Variety of subjects, 10 replies. A little science at school, 3 replies. Simple things well taught, three replies. Liberty and leisure, three replies. Home teaching and encouragement, eight replies. Merits and demerits balanced, four replies. Demerits. Narrow education, 32 replies. Want of system and bad teaching, 10 replies. Unclassed, four replies. Total, 87. There are a few cases in which an answer already given in combination, has been extracted and repeated. Merits. Education praised throughout, or nearly so, ten cases. 1. Was admirably taught, estimating thirteen to sixteen and a half, to reason, use my own mind on myself. Was taught to acquire large masses of information by reading. 
there was a little tendency to a vagrant style of reading but this was probably neutralized by other influences two well taught in classics and mathematics if possible my education should have afforded facilities for the study of the science of observation but i doubt the practicality of this at school while a schoolboy i taught myself botany chemistry etc under great disadvantages three careful and good early education at home by my mother and father then rather strict training by my father and by my first schoolmaster being carefully looked after by my father and expected to do my best four my education was well balanced it was general and of a very complete kind including chemistry botany logic and political economy by three years estimating twelve to fifteen spent in learning the latin and greek grammars were a blank waste of time five education including french german logic natural philosophy chemistry besides mathematics i lived in a house where i saw many people whose interests were of various kinds and i went to a day school where i mixed with the boys only when they were fresh and active thus i had two outer worlds to balance against each other on the whole i had i think the greatest degree of freedom possible to a boy six was at school till estimated sixteen and with a tutor in germany for six months after then technical training and teaching the education was conductive both to observation and health variety of subjects and attention to details a combination of home and school education my father having been headmaster of the school seven my father being a schoolmaster i was at some sort of school work nearly all my life but from the age of twelve i was occupied more in teaching than in learning my education included the various subjects usually taught in english schools with something of astronomy pneumatics electricity and mechanics i learnt much in conversation with my father which chiefly took an instructive form which led to think and speak freely also engaged frequently in domestic discussions on questions of general policy i had also early access to tools and materials eight i was fortunate in obtaining at school estimate eight to sixteen an insight into the phenomena of nature a subject entirely ignored at that time in almost all schools my peculiar bent for experiment was encouraged at home by my mother and there were peculiar merits in my training under professors blank and blank and especially in germany under blank nine the steadiness with which i was taught by one eccentric schoolmaster reading and accurate spelling clear neat and intelligible writing and quick and accurate computation by all the primary rules of arithmetic faults in these several branches were never overlooked and all competition was for excellence in each latin and french were evidently thrown into pleased parents going to sea at the age of thirteen i really think i started with the best education i could have had compared with my youthful messmates some of whom had passed through public schools i was far their superior in writing i soon acquired chart drawing and sketching from nature and in calculation of the day's work and in astronomical observations merits in education variety of subjects nine replies one not tied down to old courses of classics and mathematics two my master estimate fifteen to seventeen was a man of scientific and generally liberal turn of mind three sufficient groundwork in many subjects to avoid error four early introduced to many subjects of interest five a well-balanced education including chemistry botany logic and political economy six a variety of subjects and attention to details coming in contact with persons of every rank in scotland and sitting on the same form with the sons of tradesmen and ploughmen as well as of gentlemen seven and eight two cases both being englishmen praise scotch system of education nine living in a house where there were many interests and going thence to a day school where there were other and different ones merits in education a little science at school three replies one only one good thing that was object lessons though given badly and only for a short time two all the merits of my schooling i attribute to a little elementary physics and chemistry taught me between the ages of seven and thirteen three science taught me at school between the ages of eleven and sixteen merits in education simple things well taught three replies one clear neat and intelligible writing accurate spelling and simple computation two was very well grounded in arithmetic at school three forced accuracy of delineation at home estimate fourteen to sixteen 
Merits in education, liberty and leisure, three replies. 1. Unusual degree of freedom. 2. Freedom to follow my own inclinations and choose my own subjects of study, or the reverse. 3. The great proportion of time left free to do as I liked, unwatched and uncontrolled. Merits in education, home teaching and home encouragement. 8. Replies. 1. Encouragement by my mother. 2. Encouragement by my father. 3. Carefully looked after by my father and expected to do my best. 4. C7. In education, praise throughout, or nearly so. 5. During one year, estimate 17, I resided and studied with my uncle by marriage and learnt there more of the dead languages than in all my school time. 6. My private education at home was much the more valuable. 7. Home and self-education developed my observing faculties. 8. Pretty much self-taught, but encouraged to use my eyes, wits, and independent thought. Merits and demerits in education balanced. Four replies. 1. Left to myself, I pursued a discursive line. As compared with ordinary schools, I think self-teaching has many advantages for boys of active mind, but intelligent teaching and insisting on accuracy and completeness would have produced a much more efficient man. 2. The merits of my education consisted in a great number of studies connected with nature, but there was a want of system and of consecutive study. 3. The demerit of my education was a want of being thoroughly grounded. This gave me great trouble, but made me think for myself, often an advantage to me. 4. No sound instruction. The education was too general and desultory, but it gave wide interest. Demerits. Narrow education. 32 cases. 1. No mathematics, nor modern languages, nor any habits of observation or reasoning. 2. Enormous time devoted to Latin and Greek, with which languages I am not conversant. 3. Omission of almost everything useful and good, except being taught to read Latin, Latin, Latin. 4. Latin through Latin. Nonsense verses. 5. Limitation of subjects practically to classics. Absence of any scientific training, too much confined to classics. 7. Omission of mathematics, German and drawing. 8. Latin and Greek were more insisted on than modern languages. 9. In an otherwise well-balanced education, three years, estimated 12-15, at a private school were spent on Latin and Greek grammar, a blank waste of time. 10. Schoolwork directed to the cultivation of literary tastes only, and therefore not adapted to a variety of intellects. 11. Elements of natural science omitted. Nothing taught of the nature of the world around us. 12. Not taught mathematics, nor any natural science, to which I could have taken con amore. 13. Absence of instruction in the modern languages. 14. Want of the modern languages and of chemistry. 15. Want of logical and mathematical training. 16. Want of training in the habits of observation. 17. Neglect of mathematics, too much reliance on mere work of memory. Mental training overlooked in the mere acquisition of routine. 18. I could now wish that I had gone through at the university a good course of chemistry and physics as a preparation for the other branches, but the main obstacle was lack of time. 19. Want of education of faculties of observation, want of mathematics and of modern languages. 20. Not allowing my mind to follow its natural bias. 21. Neglect of many subjects for the attainment of one or two not pushing mathematics to a useful end. 22. Not enough liberty, put back by too much grounding at Cambridge. 23. At school, the classical education, viz. construing, parsing, and learning grammatical rules, was not to my taste. At Oxford, I wasted much time, having little sympathy with the university pursuits and habits. 24. Having so exclusively devoted myself to mathematics at Cambridge. 25. The classical teaching was said to be good, but I did not assimilate it. Perhaps my mental peculiarities and my special ineptitude to commit words to memory would have rendered most education, such as it was when I was a boy, ineffectual for much good. The main defect for me certainly was that precise verbal memory was the test of all knowledge. No doubt, in some things, such as languages, precise knowledge of words is essential, and therefore I refer to my own special defect in saying this. 26. My schoolwork was too predominantly classical, and nearly everything was taught on authority. 27. Persistence in giving me no holiday, and overstraining my memory when I was very young. 28. 
my principal regret is that i was unable to pursue the study of mathematics twenty nine mathematics were not pushed far enough natural science was left to the boys themselves thirty my boyhood was utterly wasted and the efforts of my manhood have not sufficed and never will suffice to repair the loss thirty one a mission of all subjects excepting the classics but particularly faulty in the want of intellectual training thirty two a military man the authority of a military education is prejudicial to the development of thought and education in matters of opinion demerits in education want of system and bad teaching ten cases one want of system two want of system three want of system four want of system absence of necessary control five bad early masters neglect at public school six essentially defective no competition nor supervision seven the very mistaken way in which languages as it now seems to me especially latin and greek were taught eight too much for memory nothing for thought nine want of thoroughness in early teaching ten careless and superficial reading demerits in education unclassed four cases one brought up in an idle class and never realized the necessity of labor in acquirement two too much cramming for examinations too much isolated being the youngest son and educated at home three two great changes in system having been educated at five universities three of which were scotch one london and one in germany four being brought up at home was perhaps too much shut out from the company of other boys summary the scientific men on my list have very generally ascribed high merits to a varied education they say as we have just seen not tied down to old courses of classics and mathematics sufficient groundwork in many subjects to avoid error a well-balanced education including chemistry botany logic and political economy coming in contact with persons of every rank and sitting in the same form in a scotch school with the sons of tradesmen and ploughmen as well as gentlemen in contrast to this others who speak of the faults of their education say no mathematics nor modern languages nor any habits of observation or reasoning enormous time devoted to latin and greek with which languages i am not conversant in an otherwise well-balanced education three years were spent on latin and greek grammar a blank waste of time neglect of many subjects for the attainment of one or two not pushing mathematics to a useful end evidence such as this fully establishes the advantage of a variety of study one group of men speak gratefully because they had it and another speak regretfully because they had it not i find none who had a reasonable variety who disapproved of it none who had a purely old-fashioned education who were satisfied with it the scientific men who came from the large public schools usually did nothing when there they could not assimilate the subjects taught and have abused the old system heartily there are several serious complaints about superficial and bad teaching which i need not quote afresh over teaching is thoroughly objected to thus in speaking of merits of education i find freedom to follow my own inclinations and to choose my own subjects of study or the reverse the great proportion of time left free to do as i liked unwatched and uncontrolled unusual degree of freedom there is much scattered evidence throughout the replies to my questions generally in addition to what i have extracted which implies that this feeling is a very common one there are many touching evidences of the strong effect of home encouragement and teaching of this i have already spoken and need not dwell upon afresh in corroboration of the conclusions stated in page two hundred and sixteen on the favourable influences of the scotch system in developing a taste for science i remark that in these replies a large proportion of the scientific men who have mentioned any merits in their education were educated in scotland as regards the subjects specially asked for even by biologists mathematics takes a prominent place two of my correspondents speak strongly of the advantages derived from logic and the weighty judgment of the late john s mill powerfully corroborates their opinions accuracy of delineation is also spoken of and owing to the extraordinary prevalence of mechanical aptitudes i believe that the teaching of mechanical drawing and manipulation would be greatly prized the interpretation that i put on the answers as a whole is as follows to teach a few congenial and useful things very thoroughly to encourage curiosity concerning as wide a range of subjects as possible and not to overteach 
as regards the precise subjects for rigorous instruction the following seem to me in strict accordance with what would have best pleased those of the scientific men who have sent me returns one mathematics pushed as far as the capacity of the learner admits and its processes utilized as far as possible for interesting ends and practical application two logic on the grounds already stated but on those only three observation theory and experiment in at least one branch of science some boys taking one branch and some another to ensure a variety of interests in the school four accurate drawing of objects connected with a branch of science pursued five mechanical manipulation for the reasons already given and also because mechanical skill is occasionally of great use to nearly all scientific men in their investigations these five subjects should be rigorously taught they are anything but an excessive program and there would remain plenty of time for that variety of work which is so highly prized as ready access to books much reading of interesting literature history and poetry languages learnt probably best during the vacations in the easiest and swiftest manner with the sole object of enabling the learners to read ordinary books in them this seems sufficient because my returns show that men of science are not made by much teaching but rather by awakening their interests encouraging their pursuits when at home and leaving them to teach themselves continuously throughout life much teaching fills a youth with knowledge but tends prematurely to satiate his appetite for more i am surprised at the mediocre degrees which the leading scientific men who were at the universities have usually taken always excepting the mathematicians being original they are naturally less receptive they prefer to fix of their own accord on certain subjects and seem adverse to learn what is put before them as a task their independence of spirit and coldness of disposition are not conductive to success in competition they doggedly go their own way and refuse to run races conclusion science has hitherto been at a disadvantage compared with other competing pursuits in enlisting the intention of the best intellects of the nation for reasons that are partially inherent and partially artificial to these i will briefly refer in conclusion with a special reference to the very important question as to how far the progress of events tends to counterbalance or remove them if we class energy intellect and the like under the general name of ability it follows that under circumstances being the same those able men who have vigour to spare for extra professional pursuits will be mainly governed in their choice of them by the instinctive tastes of their manhood the majority will address themselves to topics nearly connected with human interests a few will turn to science this tendency to abandon the colder attractions of science for those of political and social life must always be powerfully reinforced by the very general inclination of women to exert their influence in the latter direction again those who select some branch of science as a profession must do so in spite of the fact that it is more unremunerative than any other pursuit a great and salutary change has undoubtedly come over the feeling of the nation since the time when the present leading men of science were boys for education was at that time conducted in the interests of the clergy and was strongly opposed to science it crushed the inquiring spirit the love of observation the pursuit of inductive studies the habit of independent thought and it protected classics and mathematics by giving them the monopoly of all prizes for intellectual work such as scholarships fellowships church livings canonaries bishoprics and the rest this gigantic monopoly is yielding but obstinately and slowly and it is unlikely that the friends of science will be able for many years to come to relax their efforts in educational reform as regards the future provision for successful followers of science it is to be hoped that in addition to the many new openings in industrial pursuits the gradual but sure development of sanitary administration and statistical inquiry may in time afford the needed profession these and adequately paid professorships may as i sincerely hope they will even in our days give rise to the establishment of a sort of scientific priesthood throughout the kingdom whose high duties will have reference to the health and well-being of the nation in its broadest sense and whose emoluments and social position would be made commensurate with the importance and variety of their functions end of chapter four of english men of science Appendix to the English Men of Science by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leon Harvey. Appendix My schedule of printed questions, together with the ample spaces left for replies, filled 
I am half ashamed to acknowledge seven huge quarto pages. It would be a cumbrous addition to a publication like the present to reproduce these in the same form in which they were framed, and as the following extracts, with trifling variations rendered necessary by the change of form, cover precisely the same ground, and are sufficient for explanation, I abstain from doing so. A circular letter, in which I explained briefly the object of the inquiry accompanied the schedule, and I appended to it a reprint of a short article which I had written in the fortnightly review early in 1873, partially to show the interest which I had pursued coordinated inquiries, and partially as a guarantee of the tone and spirit in which the inserted communications would be treated. Also I presumed, and as it has proved not without reason that being more or less personally acquainted with a large majority of the scientific men on my list they would be inclined to put greater faith in my discretion than if i had been a stranger subject to these preparatory explanations the following are the questions that i had circulated inquiry into the attendance of scientific men please return this schedule at your earliest convenience with answers to as many of the questions as you consider to be unobjectionable and send on a separate paper any further information that you may think germane to the inquiry entries marked private will be dealt with in strict confidence they will be used only as data for general statistical conclusions note whenever you consider the grade of the quality about which a question is asked to fall near mediocrity do not make any entry at all christian names of yourself your father and your mother, also her maiden name. Designation and principal titles of yourself, your father, and the father of your mother. Your father and mother, are they respectively English, Welsh, Scotch, Irish, Jewish or foreign? If foreign, of what country? Holy or in what degree? Was either your father or your mother descended from persons persecuted for political or religious opinions, or from political or religious refugees? If so, state the precise relationship. Mention whether their political or religious opinions became traditional in the family. Occupation of yourself, your father, and the father of your mother. Specify any interests that have been very actively pursued by them, in addition to their regular occupation or profession. All the questions in the following paragraph are asked concerning yourself, your father, and your mother, respectively. Date of birth, place of birth. If you do not remember that of either your father or mother, state whether he or she resided in early life. Mention if it was in a large or small town, a suburb, a village, or a house in the country. To what religious bodies have you, self, father and mother, respectively belonged? To what political parties? Health at the various periods of life. In early adult life, what was your height to be estimated, were not accurately remembered? Was there anything distinctive in the figure, etc.? spare symmetrical muscular etc colour of hair complexion if remarkably fair dark ruddy pale sallow etc temperament if distinctly nervous sanguine bilious or lymphatic measurement round the inside of rim of your hat energy of body if remarkable as shown by power of activity power of enduring fatigue restlessness requiring but little sleep state how much early rising adventures travel mountaineering etc give a few facts energy of mind if remarkable is shown by power of accomplishing a large amount of brain work by the vigorous pursuit of interests whatever they may be etc give a few facts retentiveness of memory give facts studiousness of disposition and mental receptivity as shown by large acquirements independence of judgment in social political or religious matters give illustrations Originality or eccentricity of character. Give illustrations. Special talents. As for mechanism, practical business habits, music, mathematics, etc. Strongly marked mental peculiarities, bearing on scientific success and not specified above. The following list may serve to suggest impulsiveness, steadiness, strong feelings and partisanship, social affections, religious bias of thought, love of the new and marvellous, curiosity about facts, love of pursuit, constructiveness of imagination foresight public spirit disinterestedness are any peculiarities either very uniformly developed or also very irregularly developed among yourself your brothers and sisters or in the family of your father or in that of your mother 
State the number of males and that of the females in each of the following degrees of relationship who have attained 30 years of age or thereabouts. Grandparents, both sides. Parents, uncles and aunts, both sides. Brothers and sisters, first cousins of all four descriptions, nephews and nieces. In each of these several degrees of relationship, state the names of those who have occupied prominent positions or written well-known works, or who, from any other cause, may be considered as public characters. State their principal achievements, mention the best biographies, and the most useful among the scattered biographical notes that may exist of them, terms of award of medals, etc. Also, in each of the above degrees of relationship, give the number, with initials or name, of those whose ability in any respect was considerable, but who did not become public characters. Further information will be sent on a separate paper. Similar information is acceptable concerning other more remote degrees of relationship. Brief notes concerning hereditary peculiarities of any kind or family, bodily or mental, would be acceptable. How many brothers and sisters had you older than yourself and how many younger? How long were you at small schools, large schools, universities and at what age? Name or place of school or university and chief subjects taught there. Mention any honours of importance gained by you at schools or universities. To what extent were you educated elsewhere, taught at home or self-taught? Was your education especially conductive to or restrictive of habits of observation? Was it eminently conductive to health or the reverse? What do you consider to have been peculiar merits in it? What were the chief omissions in it and what faults of commission can you indicate? Has a religion taught in your youth had any deterrent effect on the freedom of your researches? Can you trace the origin of your interest in science in general and in your particular branch of it? How far do your scientific tastes appear to have been innate? Were they largely determined by events occurring after you reached manhood, and by what events? Have you been married? The years in which you were married made a name of your wife. Number of living sons and daughters of all ages. State any facts of peculiar interest in your wife's family. End of Appendix of the English Men of Science End of the English Men of Science by Francis Galton